Hello, and welcome to episode 000222 of the 10,000 Heroes podcast. I am Ankur Shah Delight, and I recorded today's interview with Robert McNaughton. Robert is an executive coach and facilitator who specializes in balancing interpersonal development alongside individual performance. He founded the Integral Center in Boulder, Colorado, in association with Ken Wilbur, the renowned philosopher, which hosted an international community of thought leaders, practitioners, and evolutionaries for a few years. He now hosts podcasts and works as an executive coach, supports leaders in resolving the gaps between their vision, roadmap, team alignment, and execution. But, um, you know, I got Robert to give me a watered down, digestible overview of integral philosophy, which I think is valuable, complete with a simple color coding system, which is anything but simple. And then to present some of the best and worst features of what the integral people consider each level of development. And the invitation to the listener is not to try to categorize yourself or the people you dislike, but rather to widen your perspective to the point where you realize that every perspective has beauties and flaws, or as Robert's podcast is called, uh, dignities and disasters. What are the negative consequences of our own worldviews? How can I address them by integrating aspects of worldviews that I have heretofore despised? That's the point, as far as I'm concerned. Thanks again for listening to today's show. Stay tuned after the interview for the debrief with my co-host, Nathan Ramos. And remember to get in contact with us. Email us at info at 10kh.show or follow us on Twitter at 10khshow. Okay, Robert Nunn. Okay, great. Well, hey, yeah, I've been really looking forward to talking with you today and sitting and geeking out about some integral stuff. I've been working with clients and dealing with family. So just getting back into the mental realm sounds quite relaxing to me. Yeah. Awesome. I'm, I'm looking forward to it too. So one, one of the things I wanted to start with, because my, my podcast listeners are not familiar with integral theory as a, as a role. Right. I mean, some might be, I'd love to get into some of the background of it. Um, and may, maybe just at the simpler level of like the colors, I love the color coded presentation of it. it makes it easier for people to, to grasp. And then I wanted to get into some of these topics that I, I think would be close to your heart, like relating to people, leadership from the lens of those different colors. But be- yep. before we do that, I'm just curious, what is the, you know, in my mind, integral theory, it's a philosophical movement. It's the answer to a question. What is the question that it's like helping you answer in your life? Like, why did it, why did you take it on? So I think this is a great place to start the conversation. In a certain sense, my journey with integral theory has been about balancing like the mental psychodynamic fascination with like opening up new frames and worlds and mindsets with why does this actually matter? Where is it practical? And so in my work as an executive coach, working with, you know, fast growth, venture backed company leaders, they, they need only practical, <laughs> like what's going to help them keep their company alive today. And so that's, that's a, what I've, I've had to specialize in is like, how do we make this completely relevant? And I'll come back to where is this showing up very much in a relevant way. And it's, it is it, it, very important these days. So your question, as I understood it was like, what is the question that integral theory, integral philosophy, the integral consciousness and mindset might be a response to or an answer to? Yeah, particularly for. for you, because I think many people, you know, they come with different questions, but I'm, I'm curious about kind of why it entered your life, you know, what Great. you were looking for. And so that allows me to just, you know, give a little bit of personal background um, and I'll keep it succinct. So I grew up in southern united states in a very what we might call traditional and modern achievement oriented household so traditional in the sense of i was raised catholic um very much a strong sense of family values um you know still a democratic uh voting household but you know on the more conservative side and uh and i went to a prep school that was very much meritocratic achievement oriented like we're training you to, to be the best, <laughs> you know? And, um, um, it was, it was very, you know, SAT prep prep tests yeah. as er- early as we can remember. 
And, and was that, uh, a, that was... a boarding school, like away from the family or? No, no, no. I, I lived at home. It was just, a, uh, it was a Christian preparatory school. And oh, so wow. very traditional and modern. And it was probably arguably the top private school in the su- Southern United States, um, wow. you know, and so like a university campus and, uh, you know, so upper middle class, I was raised. And so the challenge for me was that I was kind of treated that I was very intelligent at the very beginning. Everybody kind of saw me as having natural talent um, at a very early age. And I was given lots of that feedback. And then somewhere around early, you know, uh, grade school, I just went off the beaten path. And I don't know why, but I just stopped doing homework. And I just like, was like, you know what, I'm not going to just do what everybody tells me to do anymore. And my best guess is that it was just an experiment to see if you can do that. Yeah. And, so this is like, you're like eight years old or something like fifth grade, you know, oh, so fifth somewhere grade. Okay. around there. Yeah. Um, was like literally where it happened. I was talking to my parents and my brother about this this week. Um, but you know, what happened was, is like, all this, I was giving all this feedback that I was very smart and very capable, but I wasn't getting the feedback from like social status or like, uh, you know, the popular kids and the cheerleaders I wanted to date and things like that. Or I don't, maybe I didn't at the time, <laughs> but like, I wasn't, I wasn't in what society says is like, you know, the, the achievement people. And mainly cause I wasn't like, caring about the mainstream narrative. I wasn't doing homework. I wasn't trying to play football because our football team was a joke. And I just was disgusted by the whole, you know, the, the lie that this is the most important thing. Cause it clearly wasn't at least to me. Hmm. And um, so it was a very confusing and difficult to reconcile time in my life where I, there was just dissonance, you know, there was confusion around who I was told that I am and the results that I was getting in life Mm -hmm. and kind of like a loss of faith type thing. I remember like stopping, closing my eyes in church and just kind of like becoming atheist and talking to my parents about that and just slowly unsubscribing from the mainstream narrative, which of course didn't make my life easier in the normal way, but it was very liberating in the way that the enlightenment often is is liberating it frees us from this from the narratives that we think that we're subject to and so as part of that path i then moved out to boulder colorado after i graduated high school and the excuse was there was a good engineering school there and you know okay i need i need to slow slow it down just a little bit (laughs) because you went you went off the path in fifth grade and i was expecting you to get back on the path and do really well in your sats at the end of high school but you're saying that, that didn't happen. Nope. No, my, my hero's journey had a much larger arc to it. Okay. <laughs> I'm right. still forging my way back <laughs> onto the mainstream path as of today. But no, okay. I had to keep I had to keep on subscribing. So I moved away from home and I needed to get away just from the Southeast, you know, and yeah, and the, the conservative, you know, traditional world and that that achievement mentality of like, oh, I don't, I'm not valid because I'm not scoring in the same ways that I'm supposed to. And so Boulder was a good place for that because it's a very progressive, uh, in some ways, nonconformist, postmodern place. Yeah. Um, so, so, sorry, I, I, was, I said I was going to make this succinct. No, no, I, I, I have no on. desire for that to be succinct. <laughs> this is, to me, this is like the meat of it. So I'm, I'm happy yeah. to hear it. Yeah. So this is, this is where integral theory became useful for me because I, in my mind, it, kind of like in my existential narrative, like my identity narrative, I was illegitimate, right? Because I'm not succeeding in the way humans are supposed to succeed, at least my superego, my parents' expectations of how I was supposed to succeed. But Boulder was a good place to hold me there because people were a little more accepting of you as, as who you are. And that's what I needed. And even though I like, did engineering school for a bit, but eventually transferred to Naropa University, which is a Buddhist university. I was studying music and yoga there and really being lit up by education for the first authentic time in my life, Mm. where it was like more about being present and class and coming from a place of awareness. And so it was, you know, Buddhist informed. And so we were getting to be nourished by the Eastern enlightenment and um, the the inner arts and sciences. So the point of the studying was not to have some deferred benefit in the future or be a cog in somebody else's machine, but really to understand yourself better or is that? Yeah. 
yeah, I mean, there's a sense in which like I wit like there's a part of me these days where it's like, why couldn't I have just gotten an Adderall prescription and stayed in engineering school at CU Boulder? Because I see my colleagues, you know, who I'm friends with today and they're, you know, more successful in a traditional sense, you know, than I am, even though I'm not, I don't give myself enough credit. Um, but I took the road less traveled, as Robert Frost said, and it has made all the difference. And that's, you know, brought me to where I am, which I, I am extremely grateful for. But in, instead of taking Adderall and just staying on the train, I couldn't do that. It just wasn't a part of my nature. I just couldn't do something that wasn't deeply and authentically fulfilling. So I went off course. I, I skied out out of bounds, and there's a lot of pitfalls and cliffs and trees and rocks to ski into when you ski out of bounds. Yeah. And so I got a first class tour through that by you know going to Nairobi University, which was a brilliant place I needed to be at the time, but is some of the swampier sides of the postmodern <laughs> you know problem, which I'll I'll talk more about as we start getting into the theory. But it was at Naropa in Boulder where I first had my integral enlightenment. And it was basically when I saw the, uh, the applied psychologist uh, and psychiatrist Stanislav Grof, who is most, most widely known for his work with LSD psychotherapy. And he was presenting in Europa and talking about all sorts of esoteric things, but in a very grounded, reasonable, rational way. And that was the first time I'd experienced someone who could hold that broad and deep mm. of a transmission or a, of a translation more than a transmission. And I was, I was enthralled because it took my, my illegitimacy of like, I had done a lot of psychedelics in high school, which are illegal drugs. And so I couldn't talk to my parents about it. I couldn't talk mm. to my teachers, but I was having deeply spiritual experiences. And so by meeting Stan Groff, all of a sudden I was having the things that were most deeply authentic to me squared with a rational narrative of reality. Yeah. And he's, he's taking these rational, whole. these like rational tools and applying them to this domain that everybody else was just ignoring. Yeah. So. Or scared of, and, mm. and, and they're taboo mm. and they're taboo for a reason. And that's, you know, I had to learn that my own way, which I think many people in our generation and younger is, is identify with is like they, they have to um, sh be shown, not told. Mm. And I agree with that. It just has its dangers. I lost, I lost friends along the way, you know, to suicides and drug overdoses and things like that. And, and it was tragic, but I am grateful for the path that I've taken to this point. And so, you know, by having that integral enlightenment where all of a sudden I, I was more whole in and of myself, like I could, I could be more authentically in alignment and integrity with my inner narrative and the external world that I was experiencing. That to me was the gift of what integral philosophy and consciousness offers humanity. Okay, I wanna, I wanna have you say that again, just cause I wanna make sure we get this. You were more whole in and of yourself. You heard this lecture with Stanislav Graf, you felt heard, the things that were important to you were seen in a different way. They're brought out into the open, respected, analyzed. What, what does it mean that you were more yourself as a result of that experience? Yeah. So I, you know, having an inner alignment means that the story that I tell myself about who I am actually aligns with external narratives, you know, with the, with the external world. Um, and so instead of feeling like, you know, like so many people feel these days, you know, uh, nihilistic uh, of like, you know, I am just not who they, who, who they expect me to be. And it results in a lot of tragedy, depression, suicide, um, just, just being lost, I believe re relates to basically our inner narrative being out of alignment and, okay. and feeling misunderstood. So I felt deeply understood by a narrative, by a person talking about a rational worldview. Okay. But really, and, he was talking about a post-rational worldview, which I can say right. or more. <laughs> yeah, but okay, but I just, I really want to make this kind of this stark, you know, the day before sure. you went to that lecture and the day after, the difference was, would you say you had the same internal narrative, but the day after you, you saw that talk, you felt some evidence in the world that there was an external narrative that harmonized with your internal narrative, where before that, 
you just didn't see that perspective and you felt like an like outcast from all the available perspectives yes and the in the you know somatic experience of that is is uh lethargy and you know despondence mm. right um have you seen the new matrix movie yet no but i'm very <laughs> excited to do so well there's a there's a scene in which a a very well-known character says at that moment i knew my purpose and i knew what i had to do with the rest of my life i was so moved by that statement i hadn't heard it articulated like that um and that's that kind of captures my experience because i was gobsmacked by the experience of oh there's a better bigger narrative that includes me and the world needs more of that so i was inspired spirit came into me and mm. gave me the creative force and energy to do more with my life in alignment with this experience and for me that translated into uh making more sense of these wider worldviews and making them available to myself and others in my life mm. So yeah, le leveraging the experiences that you had that before there was like no way to make sense of them and you felt this permission or this encouragement, this inspiration to go forth on that path, make sense of them and that that would actually be a benefit to other people and not. Yeah, I mean, and it's great to talk about in retrospect because I think about like my best friend from high school that killed himself. And I, I, I think, you know, what was so inspiring about these times, I was like, well, if he if he had only known that there was a bigger story, he would have had more hope mm. and he might still be here to gift the world with his presence. Right. And so it's, it's these things that I can feel really deeply in my heart right now that it's like, there, there is hope out there and it can't, and the mental cognitive side of reality is plays a strong role in that. And that, you know, I, I got more into the relational dimensions later, but for me, it's kind of a heady, smart guy, geeky guy. Like I, like that's what lit me up was these mm. these cognitive worldviews, cognitive wow. development, as as we call it. Yeah, God, that's that's beautiful. I'm so glad you said that about hope because that's something I wanted to get to. That's one of the real contributions that that integral philosophy has made in my life. It's just easier to justify uh, mm. a, a, a feeling of hope. But maybe we can get into that a little bit later once mm -hmm. we explain this word that we're using without having to find yeah. it. Yeah. So, so let me take it forward from there. So also while I was at Naropa, I was exposed to the work of Ken Wilber, the preeminent integral philosopher. And Ken I later found out had been on the board of Naropa when he moved to Boulder. But I, you know, I was assigned some of his articles in my classes and I was like, who is this guy that's using like mathematical equations to talk about consciousness? So like, you're not allowed to do that. Um, but I, but Stan Groff had inspired me to get more into transpersonal psychology, which is like the understanding of the human mind and self through the lens of like non-ordinary states of consciousness, like near death experiences, altered states, psychedelics, things like that. I went to conferences on this. And then I started encountering Ken Wilber's work more and more and of creating a broader sense and understanding of the human condition, like a bigger map of reality and the various components that, that fall within to that. And then when I graduated Naropa University, I was gonna go to get a master's program, a master's degree in, in music composition, new technologies, cause I was a technologist, but uh, I got hired by the Integral Institute uh, in the meantime as, as the IT guy, and then ended up wearing a half a dozen hats in that organization. We spun off of a global media company that I was a, a key uh, principal in. And then I spun off my, community and relationship practice oriented training school, the integral center in Boulder uh, that ran from 2011 to 2018, roughly. Um, so just creating some map for the territory. Yeah. Perf <laughs> perfect. Yeah. Here. Okay. So, so maybe now's a good time to get into like nuts and bolts if, if of you, the theory. Yeah. If, if you can, in um, you know, and if we could try to, I mean, I'm sure you've had to do this many times, but to, to try yeah. and do it in a succinct and non-jargon way, but that people yeah, can I, follow the discussion. I, one of my favorite things about witnessing Ken present, and like I got to experience him in his heyday, um, or at least the latter end of his heyday, where he was vital. And I mean, this guy's like six foot four, ripped, 
and just like any question in the room, he just like spouts poetry. And like, you may not understand 50% of what he's saying, but you're committed to learning what he said afterwards. Mm -hmm. And so I've modeled a lot of my presentation tactics off of that. So I may speak jargon, but my intention is for you to want to learn what that <laughs> jargon is by the All end. Right. <laughs> so, you know, if, if we're coming from a place of like integral theory helps us reconcile seemingly paradoxical dimensions of our experience. And so the paradoxes in my life were, no, you become a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer and get a good job and raise a family. And that's the peak of human condition where my authentic felt experience was more like, no, there is a beyond human experience that is very important. And there are other things that are not what you're saying. It's like seemingly irreconcilable integral theory helps us put it on the same page. And so we can see how it fits in, in the same way that Stan Groff by saying that indigenous people have used psychedelics for their religious experience, for, for it's actually the roots of all religion, you know, comes from altered states of consciousness. You know, like that helped to reconcile my, my mindset. So Ken in, you know, the most widely translated American philosopher, um, and uh, over 35 books now, you know, of consistently working this narrative. And I love Ken's books because they're all different. They're all taking kind of a different approach of teaching, teaching the theory. And um, so when I got hired by the Integral Institute, I was, you know, asked to read, you know, Ken's books. And the experience that so many people have of reading Ken's books is the experience of feeling seen, of feeling understood by a model of reality. And so many people say that it's like, oh, this is what I've always, this is what I've always understood about the world, but I've never been able to say it so well mm. as, as the way that Ken did. And so there are a few primary components and I won't go in, into all of them. Um, you know, like, like the, uh, Quadrant theory is a very important part of integral theory, mm. which you need to study if you're going into integral theory. I won't try to unpack that now, but it's like, this is what helps the East and the West yeah. reconcile. This solves the holy wars, <laughs> if you understand quadrant theory. But the most, in some ways, controversial uh, but leading thing that people talk about and take away from integral theory is developmental theory, is the, the vertical dimensions of that we grow through stages. Now, the biggest understanding of developmental theory is for throughout history has more been about uh, children. So early childhood development, it's, it's widely agreed upon that children grow through stages of development of where they don't have a sense of self and then they start to, the ego starts to come online and then they start to become more autonomous. And there's, you know, a litany of, of maps and models and understanding that are very important for how we raise children. And one, one thing maybe I could add to that Please. is that at each stage in their development, there are activities that are possible and activities that are kind of not possible for their at or activities that are appropriate, or there's yes. things that you, the ways you can communicate with them that are appropriate in ways that just wouldn't make sense given their area of development. And just one example of that that I use frequently in the workshops that I teach is uh, Jean Piaget, who was an early childhood development and you know leading developmental thinker, uh, has these experiments. You can find a lot of them on YouTube, but where he takes a, a book that's red on one side and blue on the other and shows it to a two-year-old, says, this side's red, this side's blue. What side are you looking at? Oh, the red side. What side am I looking at? And they say, well, red. They don't have the ability to understand that a person could be having a different experience from them themselves, hmm. right? They can't take the position of other. Um, it's, it's their cognitive development doesn't have that capacity yet. But around age five, maybe earlier these days, they are able to say, it's like, oh, you're looking at the blue side. I'm looking at the red side. The second order of consciousness of being able to, to imagine that someone else is having a different experience begins to come online. And that's, that's very important when we consider the banter around narcissism and like where people become egocentric, which is a very common thing. When our resources are depleted, we go back to that two-year-old of the only thing I'm capable of tending to are my own needs. I mean, it's just such a hilarious example because almost every disagreement or spat I've ever been involved with is, is exactly that. 
it's just like I'm looking at my side and I have this moment where I just I have no desire, volition, or capability of look of imagining what that other person is seeing. Yes. And those of us that are capable of saying that are the ones that navigate through with dignity, right? Like it's okay. We are human beings. Mm. We regress to first order consciousness when we need resources. So if we can recognize our own canaries in our coal mine that tell us when we're starting to get under resources and our partners are trained to meet us there, then we can navigate things with elegance. But if we pretend that we have it all figured out, and we're just things that that's when that narcissism goes into shadow and our mm. power seeking becomes manipulation and becomes really nasty and creates a lot of harm. Mm. So okay. I'm, I'm going to derail you just because everything you're great. saying is, is so interesting and just begs for derailment. You awesome. said we regress to our first order consciousness when we need resources. Are you, are you saying this is so this, I'm not familiar with this, that in those moments that I'm doing that and I'm not able to hear what my, you know, what, what you're saying or my, my wife is saying in that moment, I'm just stuck on my perspective and I can't see it from her point of view. Is there a benefit to that for me? Am I getting resources through doing that? Is it, I mean, obviously it's not beneficial for the conversation, but is it actually a, a beneficial strategy? Is it, is it doing <laughs> something for me? Well, that's a great question. It's, it's, it's kind of hard to, to steal me on that one, right? It's like, um, I mean, it's orienting you to, to seek out to getting your needs met. How effective you're going to be at doing that is, is quite arguable. Hmm. If, if, if I know to say, you know what, I'm not, I'm not even capable of hearing what you're saying right now. I'm so depleted. Can you, yeah. I need an adult. Can you help me to the food bowl, you know, or like get some sleep or my, my partner is trained. It's like, oh, when he starts to become shaming and blaming, I need to tell him to go take a nap or something yeah. like that. Yeah. That's some high level play, <laughs> but uh, that's, that's the goal of working through a relationship. That's, that's right? what we're trying to get to is to, <laughs> exactly. be able to, to be able to figure out when the other person is triggered or incapable and, and to be able to give them what they need in that moment. And it's, it's, it's our job in having this conversation is to sh tell people that that's on the menu, that it, that those synergistic collaborative relationships are not just a fluke. They're there. You can create them and build towards them. Um, and that's the benefit of learning these bigger uh, models and maps of understanding is we can start to have compassion for ourselves and others in ways that we are incapable of before. Great. So Great. developmental theory, right? We, we understand those first really important fulcrums. Those are the most important, right? Th th those, that's why most of uh, study and understanding is anchored there. But other researchers have shown that adults continue to grow through stages of development. And it's not a hard science. We're talking about applied psychology here. It's a soft science. So we, we have to take all of these things as like orienting generalizations, as like abstractions that we have to just kind of like try to be informed by, but don't take them more seriously than they need to be because we can get into some trouble and start putting each other in boxes, mm. <laughs> which is actually the first stage of, uh, you know, what we call <laughs> integral consciousness is where we, I call it going to the zoo. It's like, Oh, there's mom and there's dad. And, you know, um, we start labeling people, which is, is a, is a good sign, but unhealthy. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so let's talk about some of these stages that, that people might go through. Now, as you get more into this, it's like the nuances that there's actually different lines of development. And there's, there's difference between like what we call cognitive understanding, which is like, like understanding levels of development versus like actual self-development, which is where our ego actually grows to embody these things. It's a mm. nuanced distinction, but important to say at the forefront. So cognitive development is actually quite doable. If people study things like integral theory or just like are educated and like are interested in learning about the past, learning about people, they can see how humans grow through development, whether they're capable of acting that way or not. And so that's why in my efforts in teaching these things, the, the biggest mistake that I made in running the integral center is I didn't push integral theory hard enough. And I'm emphasizing this because I had a, got a lot of pushback from people being like, that's too heady. It's too geeky. People aren't here to learn that. All of my other course leaders and faculty weren't, they were uncomfortable with the, the uh, cognitive challenge of learning integral theory. 
and I, you know, and I uh, um, collapsed to that. I said, okay, you're right. Let's just teach people what they want to learn. And I paid a big price to that because people didn't have the necessary cognitive scaffolding to then grow in the places they needed to grow for us to get beyond just a, a postmodern pluralistic um, challenge. So don't worry if you don't understand that, we'll come back to it. Okay, let me, let me try and get you to give an analogy that goes back to like elementary school or grade school. So what, what's an example of somebody wanting to learn something in like fourth grade or fifth grade and needing to learn like a cognitive skill in order to really make use of the thing they actually wanted to learn? Yeah, great, awesome, math, arithmetic. Who, who, what kid in school doesn't say, why are we learning arithmetic? There's adults that still don't understand why we learn arithmetic. Yeah. But anyone that understands math and how it translates into human functioning really well, understand that the ability to take those complex abstractions trains our mind into the ability to be functional in a complex world, right? Yeah. By yeah. learning basic things like addition, it's not just about being able to buy apples at a market. It's about being able to, to understand how, how the rational world functions. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> or like cook a recipe in the right order or design business processes or even like run a sports play. It's all about logic and order and how things happen in a certain way, which is yeah. what math is trying to teach us. And But for 90% of the kids in the classroom, it's a pain in the butt to have mm. to like struggle through learning multiplication tables or God forbid calculus. Right. Mm. And um, it's, it's only later that if you're lucky, you start to see the difference. And now that I work with people in, you know, undeveloped countries that don't have even basic arithmetic, you can really see the difference. Um, and so that's a good example of, you know, not understanding how, how cognitive development plays a really important role in our maturation. And so <laughs> coming back in, you know, developmental theory. So as I said earlier, like I was raised in a traditional modern achievement oriented house. So those are two stages of worldview development. Yeah. Those words have special mindsets. power in the integral world, like traditional means something specific and modern means something specific. Yeah. And so everyone recognizes the traditional worldview. It's very much us versus them. There is a right and a wrong way of doing things. It's very morality focused. And think traditional religion, right? The Bible, the Quran, you know, any of the, especially the Abrahamic religions that are really discerning about what's right and what's wrong and have created through people a lot of suffering throughout history of like, no, this is the way we do things. Another religion says, no, this is the way. And the holy wars start. Yeah. Right. So that's the traditional worldview, which has taken care of humanity for thousands of years. Yeah. Like there's, the Catholic there's order, churches. there's right and wrong, there's in and out. Uh, yes. Yeah. That pulled us out of the power realm of tribal, you know, really, really older worldviews that were hurting more people. You know, the, the traditional worldview was a beautiful enlightenment but it has its dignities and its disasters, right? It has its unhealthy sides. The unhealthy sides are of just thinking that there's only way, one way to do things, right? And being absolutist, right? Of, of telling someone, of thinking that I know what the right way is and, and thinking that you're wrong. So birthed out of the unhealthy aspects of a worldview and a way of being are the next, the next level, the next enlightenment. And so the enlightenment that was birthed out of the traditional worldview was the enlightenment, <laughs> the rational enlightenment of the Renaissance, where, you know, Voltaire said, remember the cruelties. And then the, the rational worldview of objectifying reality, of measuring things and having a, a map of reality that not just in conversation, we can have a shared reality, but any other person can, can come on board with this. And so that's science, scientific empiricism of like, you know, doing a double blind experiment to prove that something exists in objective reality, right? Um, also coming along with that is like the, the, the hierarchical or meritocratic elements of like, no, there's, there are better ways of doing things, right? There are normative conditions. 
that there's, there's a better way to cook an omelet as well as there's a better way to build a building that doesn't mm-hmm. crumble uh, when people, you know, climb into it. Yeah. And there's like external measurable goals that we can, we can set as like fitness tests and decide whether these different strategies achieve them or not. And so it's just like exactly the move from somebody says, you know, the, the relationship between the earth and the sun to we can actually predict it and test it and decide that the cosmology is actually going to be different because it's verified. And build and build a bridge, you know, across a chasm that like people can move across. So this was the birth of the modern world as we know it today was the rational enlightenment of this stage of development. And, you know, you think about something like as simple as like the invention of chlorine in water saved more human lives than any other measurable event in history, right? Of course, here we are sitting around in our developed, you know, you know, towns being like, I don't like chlorine in my water. Yeah, yeah. I don't want a vaccine, right. um, but it's like, we'll get there. <laughs> and so that's the modern development. So that's, that's one of the first important fulcrums that most people need to know about traditional to modern. And then we'll get into the next fulcrum out of the disasters of the modern enlightenment, which, you know, don't even need to be named, but we'll go ahead and name them, right? Like overemphasis on hierarchy, which now people talk about, like, let's tear down the patriarchy and like, you know, wanting flat governance structures in, in, in companies. But uh, help me out here. What are some of the problems with the modern? Oh, I mean, there's, there's the atomic bomb, right? Like that for me, that's, that's like, okay, right. we, we created the, the most beautiful, like advanced physics and we used it to create tools where now we're all at the brink of destruction and not just us, but potentially many other species at the same time. And that, that's something that's like, to me, it's- The, the capability of genocide, of yeah. uh, self-assured destruction, right? Yeah, exactly. Great, great point. And not to mention corporate greed, right? Regulatory capture of co- corporations basically causing lots of suffering because of you know, what they've built um, or envi- environmental disaster, ex- external externalities of all the good that we have created. Oh, while we are chlorinating the drinking water, we are poison- poisoning another species that's going to have untold ramifications afterwards. Yeah, like our whole energy systems, you know, we're, we're generating this like amazing amount of energy for certain species, you know, at the at the detriment of other members of that species, depending on where you live related to like the toxic power plant or yes. what else is going on in the rivers or the forests or whatever. Yes, beautiful progress that now has all of our family members glued to their smartphones over dinner and can't even make eye contact. Right. Um, if you want a great steel manning of the enlightenment, Steven Pinker's Enlightenment Now, I think should be a college course or taught in high schools. Um, it's I, I encourage everyone who's listening to this to read and study Enlightenment Now by Steven Pinker to have a full grokking of the successes of the Enlightenment. So these disasters that we've named out birthed the postmodern worldview, the postmodern Enlightenment. Now the postmodern Enlightenment is identified in, in a lot of nuanced ways, but as soon as you start tracking it, you'll start seeing it everywhere. But it is about deconstruction. So with the traditional and modern world, we constructed all these narratives about what, how life is supposed to be. We constructed all these uh, uh, buildings. We constructed all these uh, uh, structures of like how governments of um, just how things are supposed to work. These normative structures of what is supposed to be the best way. Postmodern is, is the genius at tearing those things down of burning through anything that isn't of the highest integrity or in the unhealthy cases, everything burn okay. down everything. Okay. But the, the point is to, to go and it, okay, I'll ask you this question is the point to t- take only like the cream of the crop of the traditional and the modern and everything else that is not serving or that is not as its highest potential, the postmodern ideas to, to just kind of filter that out and burn that out. Yeah. Is that it, right? it, it, Yes, the, the, the postmodern ideal is to destroy anything that creates suffering. And now it's more of an integral ideal, which is beyond postmodernism. Okay. We'll get there. So I was giving look, them too much credit <laughs> to look for the good sides as well. 
Yeah, exactly. They're not capable of that yet because here's the problem. The, the marker of traditional, modern, and postmodern, we call these all this, the first tier of consciousness, is that they think their worldview is the only worldview, right? The tra traditionalists look at the modernists and call them heretics, right? Yeah. The modernists look at the postmodernists and call them hopeless hippies, right? The postmodernists look down at both of them and call them heathens. Yeah. And, you know, um, savages <laughs> or, you know, greedy, you know, Gordon geckos, you know, of just like the, the patriarchy, these structures, of the patriarchy, which are a cancer upon our humanity and we must destroy them all or Mother Gaia will suffer. Hmm. Right. But there have been some amazing dignities of the postmodern enlightenment. Tremendous. It is a tremendous. It's really when we talk about enlightenment from an Eastern perspective of being free from the ego, that is the postmodern enlightenment that there is things more important than my success. That was the enlightenment that I had in high school that has me leave the beaten path and not date cheerleaders. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but so what did that serve? Well, civil rights, right? The, like, the, the, the freedom of marginalized cultures in advanced civilizations, the ability to, to get rid of some of these old expired policies that were creating undue suffering, women's suffrage, right? Um, a, a, a allowing more votes. So that's, that's civil rights. What other kinds of enlightenment did it create? Well, it, it, environmental progress, the seeing that our efforts of our modern efforts were, were creating external effects on our environment and creating new policies and progress towards protecting those environments. I mean, beyond that, even more important in, in my experience is the liberation of the mind, of uh, being able to take myself less seri seriously, relieving anxiety, you know, not committing to so much in my world that I'm not sleeping well anymore and I'm treating those around me poorly, but allowing myself to be liberated and live a simple life. How are we doing? Great. Okay. So, I mean, it's, it's interesting because I think... You know, and it really depends what you listen to in terms of news or social circles. And I don't do very much of that, so I'm not, I'm not that tuned in. But I do have a sense that this um, this postmodern mentality, what's called green, in some circles, is really yes. under attack. And so I appreciate you saying some of the good parts about it, because I feel like it's getting attacked from all sides. Um, good. Of, co of course, we're gonna we're gonna now state the bad parts of it as well. But good. It's, I'm it's really glad. Nice to hear that you acknowledge that because that's, it's actually really important. And we can translate that into, if we're going to, if we're going to learn anything from integral theory and like help our relationships in our lives, we have to include before we transcend, right? We have to like consider what is the enlightenment that I'm in relationship with before I cast it aside. You know, uh, uh, GK Chesterton, Chesterton's fence. Have you ever heard of, of Chesterton's fence? Well, the concept of like when we Not come across fence, no. a boundary, like a fence, instead of just tearing it down, we have to inquire into why is the fence there, right? That's the mature move before just jumping over it or running away from it. Like we have to say like, who built this fence and why is it here? Why, why might there be a statue of a Confederate general here? before just saying, nope, they had slaves, they need to be stricken from the record, right? Mm. That is the, the challenge. That is the rigor of mature, sophisticated leadership is the consideration of other perspectives first. So thank you for acknowledging that, that if we are gonna have any shot of saving humanity from the, <laughs> the disasters of post-modernity, we have to be, we have to be intimately understanding of why it's here, what it's good for, how it lives within us and how we are blessed to have it. Yeah, I mean, to me, to me, that's the, it's like the social analog to what we're trying to do in meditation of rather than just react to every sensation, to have a moment of pause and be like, I have the option of how I'm gonna to react to this. You know what, you, what you're saying about the, the Confederate general. Yeah, I mean, the first thing you think of, like these people had slaves, why are we celebrating? I mean, the, the immediate reaction is of course to efface all of the history. And I mean, we just don't want that to have ever happened. Yeah, it, it happened. It. Yeah, 
But then, but then if you can analyze it in a little more nuanced way, you still might take down the statue, but at least you have this opportunity to understand all the different angles of what it, what it means to all yeah. the different people. And to understand that, you know, all of us, we all have slavery in our bloodline. We all have kings and rapists in our bloodline. All of us. No one is free from that. No one, no one is pure. And knowing that, does that mean we just lop off our family tree? Right? Because I don't like my dad or my mom, does that mean I just remove them from my life? Now, there can be a good argument for that. There can be a good argument for taking space. I moved away from home so that I could be autonomous and I could, I could grow into myself more. But do we want to completely get rid of them and lose the blessing of our ancestry through the, the narrative transmission and all the generational chi that's available, that's built, that was given to us to nurture us in our descendancy? So and that's, that's the inquiry that I, I, I push. And so, you know, in service of that, like having the ability to have these conversations and to, and to rigorously look at ourselves and, how, and our lives in this way. So thank you for allowing us to take that breath. And in the postmodern enlightenment, yes, that's where we get the ability to take a breath, to be present with our experience and then acknowledge the path forward. What are some of the other disasters of the postmodern green world and what comes to mind for you? I mean, for me, one, one of the things that I, I kind of react to or I, I, I dislike is, is a sense of division and judgment. Mm -hmm. that there's this like, mm -hmm. yeah, there's this constantly accelerating threshold of what it is to be cool or to be okay or to be not attacked. And that it's just like, it's like this dance that's always happening. And if you're not saying the right code words at the right time, then all of a sudden you're on the other side. Hmm. And I feel like mm -hmm. what, what, what that does is it really fractures people. And as someone who I, I grew up, uh, you know, I read the communist manifesto in, in high school, I, I grew totally. up really like feeling a lot of affinity with the left. And I see how the mm -hmm. left is in the modern world. And it's just, um, it's been, it's been like that ever since I was in college 20 years ago, it's always mm -hmm. been a disaster. It's always been like mm -hmm. super fractured and, and like interjudgmental and just not, mm -hmm. It's like the opposite of what I would want from like an old union folk song of everybody like getting together and working together. It's like, <laughs> there's, totally. just, there's just like a lot of like bickering and judgment that I, that I, I associate with this like postmodern green vibe. Yeah, I, I appreciate you bringing our attention there because a big, a, a, a great way to summarize the problem with postmodernity is the performative contradiction in that they the perform the postmodern parts within me want to uh, want to judge the violence of others, mm. right? Look at how oppressive this meritocracy is. You know, look at how backwards these people are. And then I use violence to try to get rid of them, mm. right? That there's this this immense violence that comes out of saying that, like, well, you know, violence begets violence, um, or as uh, um, I just forget the uh, Popper, the philosopher Popper, uh, you know, shared a lot. It's like, you know, uh, justifying the use of violence if it's in service of getting rid of violence. Now, that's a that's the, a pretty rugged old power tool, you know, to go back there. But I think similarly for me, that's my biggest concern with the postmodern condition, the unhealthy postmodern condition, is that it's it's extremely more violent. And in some ways, more concerning than like old school, like traditional violence, because it thinks it, it isn't being violent. It's mm. right. It's, it's like the power goes into shadow because the postmodern worldview doesn't think that power should exist. All of that power energetic goes into shadow and comes out in, in very ugly ways. Um, <laughs> the watermelon, the green on the outside, mm, red, red on, on the, the inside. Because yeah. <laughs> uh, so we haven't been talking about colors, but like, you know, the old power tribal mentality is red. The traditional, you know, church-based morality is blue. Orange is the modern, you know, uh, uh, worldview uh, hierarchy. And green is post-modernity. Great. Uh, but and, yeah, thank you. For, that. <laughs> but I, I love the colors because they're just such great shortcuts, you know, they're monosyllabic. Mm -hmm. I love that. 
Um, would definitely make us sound like cult members. <laughs> Yeah, if that were the case, I'd be a member of a different cult every week that I do this exactly. podcast. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let's let's bring this um, back with an example because I feel like mm -hmm. we've like kind of went off into theory world. So, mm -hmm. one of the things I know you're doing right now is executive coaching. Yes. So I'd like Great. I'd like to hear about leadership styles and maybe examples of leadership styles from each of these colors, from like the red pre-traditional, from the blue traditional, from the orange modern rational and from the green postmodern and then maybe an example of what leadership would like from a second tier from a teal perspective that hopefully Integral integrates leadership. all the best of these four yeah great great and, and if possible so let, to make this a little bit harder if it yeah. could be the same situation but like four different okay. ways the executive or five could okay. react yeah let's take something very relevant right so um the, in the past two years there has been a a global condition of a pandemic. Um, <laughs> I've heard of that. Yeah. The pandemic infected us in ways that we didn't imagine, which was uh, George Floyd was murdered the summer uh, after the pandemic started. And so this infection, you know, teased another infection, right? And so the, the Black Lives Matter uh, movement was had gasoline thrown on the fire and the world reacted to that because we were in an under-resourced position, right? We were already in a malnourished place from being isolated in the pandemic. And so then we were not ready to, to be able to tackle these things. And, and there's been some, some wonderful good that has come out of this, this latest beat uh, of civil rights and in dealing with the, the systemic racism and all of those things. But as Everything all it does, there's, you know, there's some overcorrections that have happened too. So in the corporate world, the way this has looked like is there has been uh, a, a massive investment of attention on diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? It's like, okay, George Floyd was murdered. We have to do some more racial reckoning in our culture. And so how does that look with how minorities have power in organizations? Well, the way we solve that is by investing in diversity, equity, and inclusion. That means how diverse is our leadership team or the investors? Like the people who have decision-making authority of this corporation, how much are they representing marginalized cultures, right? Wait, and you're saying that the leadership teams of these large corporations are actually interested in this? Oh, if you, it, yes. Like if, if you're not, you're risking losing investment capital because now the largest uh, holders of capital, um, you know, of investor capital, are saying, like, not only do you have to make us a profit, but don't hurt the environment and make sure that you have people of color, women, and beyond on your leadership team. It doesn't matter if it's the best person. It has to be someone representing these, these other categories. So, you know, it, it, this is very dicey territory because people have a lot of strong feelings about this. I am a white male talking about this. And so I'm naturally gonna have my biases in, in relationship to that. So forgive me my biases as I continue to mansplain this <laughs> yeah. as, as, as is requested. Um, so, Virtually every leader and company that I work with is having to, to respond to the demand from investors, shareholders, and employees, and customers to, have, to be doing their part in the racial reckoning. So certainly United States-based companies, but, but global companies as well. Um, you know, the company in China aren't having to deal with this as much because they're a technocracy. They are fully committed to just only employing the most talented people for the most important roles. The postmodern condition in the United States is much more complex because it's not about just being the best. That's meritocratic. That's modern. We have to be satisfying multiple stakeholders in multiple constituencies, including diversity, equity, and inclusion. So, a lot of companies have already, but there's, a, there's already been attention on this for, for, for many years. Um, equal opportunity, right? Uh, um, 
some of the, the, the more antiquated terms for this. So here's what happens. You're a CEO of a company. You are here. You are hearing about George Floyd and all of all of the things happening there. Your employees are saying, "Hey, what are you? What are we doing here at our brand in response to this movement?" Your customer base is wondering if they're going to buy your your product. How are you representing this? And your shareholders and your board of directors are now turning their eye through this lens at you. So. What type of leader are we talking about here? So if we are a, 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 a traditional leader, in a certain sense, we might as well just kind of break this down just into like the, the, the modern leader and the postmodern leader, because there's, there's not a whole lot of traditional leaders. I mean, we could talk about the church, right? <laughs> and that, that that's Yeah, I mean, I'd be, I, I'd be curious to see what the traditional, you know, in your estimation, kind of if, even what the, um, you know, the pre-traditional leader yeah, the, the yeah, pre-traditional leader just uh, throws you out of the tribe, right? Uh, so the, the better example of traditional leadership would say it's like um, when the leader of a church is accused of of harm. And, you know, let's let's talk about sexual misconduct in the Catholic Church. You know, watch the movie Spotlight if you want a good understanding of how that played out, right? So the all of a sudden it's uncovered that, you know, members, leadership of the church, priests are con committing sexual misconduct. It blows back the church. How has the church been handling this? Well, by playing a shell game. They basically move this priest to another location. They're not handling the situation. They're assuming they know best and they know how to handle things. And they're just doing in some ways the minimal required to keep the, to keep the, the, the fire from engulfing. Um, so coming back to our, our, our previous analogy, you know, of a, of a CEO of a company that's demanding a response to diversity, equity, inclusion, a modern meritocratic leader, regardless of if they're male or female or white or a person of color is gonna say like, I hear what you're saying. I understand it. I don't care. I only hire the people that are best for the roles. The shareholder fiduciary responsibility I have for profit to the shareholder is the only top priority here. And I serve that priority by delivering the best products through our understanding of what the customers want. And it, it, it's somewhat dismissive in maybe a patronizing way, but let's give it the benefit of the doubt that it's keeping a sense of priority. Now, a great example of this, which is actually a, a, an example I, I, I quite condone was um, Brian Armstrong, CEO of Coinbase. When this started flaring up at his company of employees demanding a response, diversity, equity, and inclusion, he published a memo. Did you, did you hear about this? No. It's a great example. He published a memo that said, we are a mission focused company, meaning that our job here, all of us is to focus on the mission of Coinbase, not our politics. So you can have your politics, do not bring them to the workplace. Do not demand, you know, like things that are unrelated to the mission of Coinbase here. And if you disagree with that, here is a handsome severance package. 10% of the workforce at Coinbase took the severance package. And hi history writes itself, the success that Coinbase has had due to the cryptocurrency enthusiasm, but they went public this past year. They are very excess successful in relationship to their mission. I think that is a, a somewhat healthy response and arguably, you know, even, even reflecting of, of, of higher order. A lot of postmodernists or, or otherwise have lots of criticisms of that response. Does that make sense? Sure. Yeah. So that's As kind of like an a, maybe an ideal modern response. Mm -hmm. So what are the downsides of that? So like a, an unhealthy modern response. Well, if I just patronize and just say, it's like, no, I'm, I'm the leader. It's my job to, to know what's best. I don't need to hear more about your complaints. Shut up, go back to work or, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll fire you if you keep making too much noise because you're slowing down the progress and then I'm really going to be in hot water. Well, what happens? Um, culture is poisoned, yeah. right? If oh, I yeah. fire someone for disagreeing with leadership, you know, 
what does that do to other people there? Are they going to be excited about coming to work and working their hardest? They might work hard out of fear, but is that going to deliver the, you know, the best quality of work? No. W what else happens? Well, employees start to talk to each other and, and say like, you know, this one's, I'm definitely going to lose talent. Like if I have a plus talent, which is the most important thing to have in a competitive workspace, they're going to say, it's like, well, I could actually work over here and have a place where my leaders are going to listen to me. And like, I can actually do work the way that I want to do and will be more appreciative, appreciative of the culture where I come from. Yeah. And the, the difference to me in those two examples is, is respect. Mm. There's a, there's a mm -hmm. level of respect in that memo you talked about that is not present in the other, in the other example. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's more of just like a terse. <laughs> yeah. Patronizing. It's patronizing. It's, it's not considering that there's any kind of uh, thing that I should consider in, in what's coming back up. Now, what, what we're starting to see more, and I've had some relationship of working with, is uh, the, if it's a big company, the workers will unionize. They'll regress into using an older tool in the toolbox. Unions come from the traditional worldview, and unions are very effective. We're talking about blue-collar workspaces, um, you know, a, a postal union or like a, you know, industry-related unions where we can have collective bargaining to work with the companies that just have no incentive to keep us happy, you know, so we, we need to have our own, you know, authority, but tr taking transplanting a traditional power tool, like a union into a modern uh, competitive workspace, like a, a software company or something like that is, is, is a really bad fit in, in in my opinion i'm already i can hear people calling me a, a bootlicker you know I'm, I'm a consultant that's supporting the executives and anti-unions um <laughs> john oliver did a, did a write-up on uh, a journalistic piece on unions and one of the um you know last week tonight is that the name of the show mm -hmm. um it was it was good in saying like you know the the problems with you know uh resisting unions it didn't tell anything about the reason why you should consider before union being a, the best idea but but, but rather really... rather than like criticizing the union i think what you know what i what i hope you're going to say is is actually that the incentives are at such a higher order in a software company that their leadership has to be so much more sensitive to the emotion of the a plus software engineer that it comes yes. like far beyond like what a union could possibly give that person. And there are much more elegant vehicles for integrating perspectives um, from a workforce that, that are, are, are actually being hammered, you know, because when you regress, it's kind of like um, if you don't listen, like let's talk about it at a governmental level. If you're a, a monarch or a leader of a country and you don't listen to your people for long enough, there will be rebellion and re revolution, right? Revolutions are bloody. That's bad, right? Yeah, and, and costly. Some can, yes, costly, bloody, but perhaps necessary. I mean, they're certainly littered throughout history in showing that it's like, well, you know, when people are blinded with power, you know, revolutions, you have to overturn them. But in my, my phrase is like revolutions are bloody, evolutions are sweaty. It's on the menu too. We can evolve. We can innovate and integrate tensions into higher orders of evolution through hard work and hard work of listening as well as of execution. So if, you know, using like a, a union when there are more elegant options, the problem with that is it, is it ties our hands behind our back. We can't actually have co collaborative conversations that allows us to listen more because managers aren't allowed to talk to their employees, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's good. There's good reasons for that. You know, I'm, I'm in favor of unions in the right circumstances, but they shouldn't be the first blush, you know, move if, you know, for, for a progressive workspace with a growth mindset where everybody actually wants to grow and do a better job. Am I doing okay in wrestling yeah. with this one? <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. But uh, yeah, so I want to hear the, the postmodern, the, the kind of ideal postmodern response to this question then. Yeah. Okay. So that, that was the, we did the healthy modern response. We did the unhealthy modern response and the result being, you know, your workforce rebelling and revolution. Yeah. Um, so what's the postmodern response? Okay. So the postmodern response is let's talk about it. Let's listen. Let's encourage our leaders to be better listeners 
to effectively leverage our one-on-one -on -one meetings to understand where people are coming from. What are the tensions? We do 360s. We do feedback assessments of management and in, through anonymized vehicles that allow people to actually say the problems. And then the people, the, the workforce see that the later leaders are actually hearing them and implementing. So when I work with my clients, we often run 360s and then we get the feedback and then we go back to the direct reports, the teams and say, here's what I heard you say. Here are the top three things that I'm investing in based on what I heard you say. And here's how I'm going to do it. And here's how you can support me on that. So if I do the thing where I just vamp through the whole meeting, here's the words you say to call me out on it. And yeah, the first so, person so it that really like closes the, the feedback loop. It's like, I, yeah. I, I gave you some feedback. You process it. You thought about it. You distilled it to some concrete goals and you're sharing. It's like a say back. And then you're sharing that back with me and I feel totally heard. Yes. It, 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 like if we're going to have a hierarchy of power and, there, and trust needs to be actually fostered there, then the people that are, 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 are lower in that authority chain need to see that our better interests are held for us. It's kind of like, you know, I hate making this comparison because it's, it's a little patronizing. But if we look at a family structure where there are parents and children, it's a very good metaphor or analogy for what happens here because the parents have to have more authority because they have more ability to handle the complexities of life and keep the kids from dying, <laughs> right? But the kids don't know that. And all they're just saying is like, I'm not allowed to go run into the woods whenever I want to. Yeah. So we can understand, we, want, we don't need to go further into the analogy to understand the distortions, but also the, the importance of the parents listening and then showing the kids as they mature that actually we are working for your benefit. We're listening to you and we're integrating your tensions into as we grow. Yeah, Being, but, being a, a parent is very humbling. So I have some resistance to that metaphor. I think we could, we could sharpen it a little bit because Good, in, the, in, the, in the corporate you know, analog of that, there's not um, a difference in developmental capacity between, I, I would think, between the CEO and the employees it's rather a difference in responsibility or commitment or something like that to the institution. I, yeah, I, I, can, I can agree with that to a degree. I think oftentimes senior management managers and senior leaders are in those positions because they have already gone through the cycles of individual contributors and they understand the industry, they understand management, they understand the, the likely pitfalls that the, you know, the employees are going to go through. So they developmentally, the argument is they are more development in the, air, in the domain that is necessary for them to hold leadership in. And now it, there are subjective matters there and we all, and there's definitely things that overlap there. Mm. And it happens all the time in corporations where, People think they should be in higher leadership just because they've been in the workforce longer, and then they take out their mismanagement of their self on their employees, and they, you know, silo and do all sorts of nasty things. Right? There's all sorts of reasons why why people lower on the totem pole could be should be upset, mm -hmm. and there should be escalation processes for this. And so that's where the this the systems, the lower right quadrant, the systems have to evolve as well as the individuals, as well as the culture, as well as the, you know, behaviors. So um, that's what that's, and we're seeing those evolutions happen with more elegant um, ways of integrating things like having 360 assessments, but also having more evolved governance structures, right? If you think about um, holacracies, right? Where, where there are elegant ways for decision-making to be democratized now, there are very unhealthy and immature forms of that. It, it's more sociocratic roots. There's a lot of attraction to flat governance structures. So if we talk about like what's an unhealthy example of a postmodern leader is they just collapse to doing whatever the people say. Populism. Right? Yeah, exactly. A po or populitis, <laughs> mm. inflamed populism, right? Pluralitis, pluralism, right? It's like they're... 
there is no one right way. There's only every other way, which means we do nothing. Yeah. Um, there's no vision. The, there's no leadership. There's no continuity. This is most inflamed in my experience in nonprofit leadership. Now, nonprofits are particularly prone to this because they don't have the incentives that not that for-profit companies have of staying consistent and on track. Say what you will about you know, fiduciary responsibility to the bottom line of profit being a problem. It is quite effective at keeping people marching off the same sheet music. Oh yeah. I mean, it's just so easy to hold a vision that has numbers because you can just track where you are with those numbers. Yeah. It's, it's just so much, so transparent for our minds to grab a hold of, even, even on like a personal level, you know, I, I work as a, as a coach as well. And if you have somebody like the goal, my goal is like, okay, this year I'm going to, get to a certain level with meditation, you know, it's just so hard. It's so amorphous to capture what that, what is the outcome goal? What are the process goals? Am I actually hitting it? Or if it's like a revenue goal that you're trying to help someone achieve, it's just, it's just very clear whether they're making progress to that or not. So, yeah. you know, there's all these downsides of the profit motive, but one of the upsides is just like yeah. the total clarity. I want to share an example of this that just came across, uh, uh, my experience as uh, Christmas time is when we're recording this and we just watched our family, the miracle on 34th street, um, the old, the original miracle on 34th classic Christmas movie where, you know, Santa, the true Santa comes and works at Macy's for a while. And what happens is as Santa, he's recommending to parents that they go, that they don't have something at this Macy's, but they should go shop at another store where they have it in stock. And all of the you know managers are like, oh my God, he's telling people not to buy at Macy's. But then the CEO of Macy's is like, we have been getting appreciation from all of our customers that say the true spirit of Christmas is here because we actually care about you getting the right thing. So they're actually shopping here more because we don't care so much about just owning everything. So our profits are going way up because we are less concerned about profit. And then all the other business leaders are like, well, we can't let Macy's be the only one. So there's this revolution. So Santa causes this revolution in more conscious business that drives more profit. <laughs> so <laughs> watch that one again next Christmas or sometime because uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful conscious leadership, conscious business leadership uh, uh, example. So, um, you know, coming back to the, the unhealthy postmodern responses to diversity, equity, and inclusion, I got to see a lot of them being in the position. I imagine you did too. But, um, you know, so the big one first off right away was that all company leaders were expected to make a statement, to publish a letter on behalf of Black Lives Matter and, you know, the racial reckoning. Now, in my network, in our ecosystem, we saw CEOs get fired for not writing a letter um, and being patronizing about it. We also see CEOs get fired for writing a letter and not saying the right things. So it was damned if you do, damned if you don't, which is another uh, example of really unhealthy postmodernism is that um, there's, there's not a lot of logic. There's not a lot of logical consistency. It's kind of like um, the, a common one is don't center white conversations. Like if you're a white person, don't center yourself in your opinion. Let marginalized people speak. On the other side, silence is violence. So you can't keep your mouth shut anymore, white people. You have to speak up. So basically you're damned if you do, damned if you don't in a, in a kind of a, a, gross, a gross way. And we saw that happening in leadership quite a bit. Academic leadership, it's even nastier. Like academic leadership, <laughs> we're still praying for is able to pull itself out of the rut. But there's some amazing thinkers. Um, the Coddling of the American Mind by Jonathan Haidt, I think is in, in, in our toolkit for understanding postmodernism and what to do about it, especially with academic leadership and in business leadership. The Coddling of the American Mind has been my most recommended book for the past three years for the way that Haidt was able to uh, codify the problems with the postmodern leadership. And I could, I could say, the, the, the three, the, the great, three great untruths, but I don't want to derail us there. Um, so, so that's one unhealthy response is to, uh, so I saw one leader of a, uh, of actually a religious organization 
that published his letter about Black Lives Matter. Um, but then he, he included saying, we're all racist. You know, we are all racist. And if we, and actually Jesus was racist too. And he just kind of, he went a little too creative in his response. His shareholders were not happy with that. The other, the other leadership and basically the other side of the argument came down really hard on him for mm -hmm. that response. Um, so, so we talked about kind of like what happens in nonprofit leadership where basically you just kind of, you, you have to listen to everybody. There's a doubling down on DEI um, and flattening the governance structure. So there's, so holacracy includes hierarchy as well as heterarchy. So we're, we're, we're democratizing decision-making, but there's still a hierarchy. There's still the purpose that's defined by the board, the fiduciary responsibility to profit and how that chunks down. So it's, holacracy is, is, it's a dicey territory. Like I don't recommend holacracy to fast growth venture backed startup leaders, but to people who are comfortable enough in being experimental and innovative with their governance structures, it's, it's worth learning about um, the tools that come from that toolkit. Okay. Okay. How are we so doing? Where would you I, like I, me to go? I, I think, I think, I think we're good on the past. You know, we, we've, we've covered where we're at these different, like first tier, you know, points of view, the traditional, the modern, the postmodern, how they react to the situation. And so now maybe we can, we can go out with, well, I, I gotta love to talk about hope a little bit too, but we, I, yes. what I want to, what I want to talk about, okay, let's, okay, let's talk about hope a little bit. So one, one of the things that I really look to with integral theory or just this whole way of seeing the world is that all of the horrible shit that I perceive and sometimes experience is really part of this larger unfolding and it can like it can serve a process either in my life personally or in like the larger societal story and so mm -hmm. i don't have to be so stuck in the details of it mm -hmm. i can i can zoom out and i can see like this this larger story where it where it makes sense mm -hmm. is that is that I and mean, that's my experience and it's very helpful for me I'm curious, is that, is that like part of the general integral worldview or did I just kind of bastardize it? No, I think that's the cornerstone. I mean, like the true, like foundation of really like human elegance is that first person experience of like uh, uh, unconditional well-being, right? That, that truthfully, 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 it's all good. And that's, that's the object of having a contemplative practice, a meditation or practice, a yoga practice, any practice, but, you know, religion, you know, comes from the word religionis, what reconnects us to the divine, to the absolute, the absolute is only love, is only good. And so when we're able to touch base with the deep part of us that knows things are all good, that solves everything literally that allows us to take second person perspective and third person perspective and fourth order consciousness and fifth order consciousness. Right. And so it starts, it all starts there and learning these other distinctions, ideally create a scaffold that allow us to return that place and go back up and down the ladder as, as needed. And if we are high impact leaders, meaning we have a great deal of commitment and responsibility for the outcome of our visions, in big organizations or even in a family or a project, if I'm gardening, right? We have to be able to go up and down that ladder with elegance consistently day in, day out, come pandemic or not. So what, what gives us hope? And really that's why integral consciousness and integral philosophy have given me so much hope and why I've doubled and tripled down on it in my life and, and, and try to translate it in for leaders is because it's focused on the good, true, and the beautiful. Like what is most important and how do we keep our attention there and not get sunk into the swamp of fear, of nihilism, of narcissism, and of hedonism. And those truly are the risks of postmodernism. If we cut off the head of inspiration and vision of like, you know, modernity and go into postmodernity, it's the headless horseman. 
of where it's just unconscious deconstruction that's driven by fear in our baser in our baser motives. Hedonism, what feels good right now? Mm. Well, not the best things for everybody all the time. Mm. I want to watch Netflix and eat ice cream if I'm just listening to what my body wants right now without any consideration about it. That's not maturity. That's regression, right? Narcissism, power going into shadow, right? Nihilism, thinking that there isn't actually a good, true, and a beautiful place. That's that's forgiving. That's drinking from the waters of the, the river of oblivion, Lethe, right? That's being stuck out in oblivion where we've forgotten that we've forgotten who we truly are. Ah, Lethe, ah, Lethia is the moment where the clouds part and the sun comes back out and we can see the clear blue sky and we can see the shore on the other side of the, of the river of where we're going, of where our true nature and our home is, that place that created the warmth that is truly a part of our nature, but we may have forgotten it for a time. We can get back there and we can help others get back there as well. So second tier consciousness, when we transcend past postmodern consciousness from the disasters of postmodernity that creates conditions for second tier integral consciousness, what they call the momentous leap, because it's not just like going from modern to postmodern. We have to really reconcile all of it to get into that transcending but inclusive place of looking for the dignities of postmodern modernity and the dignities of modernity and the dignities of traditionalism as well as the power and tribal worldviews and can harmonize all of that internally and externally. That's the integral vision. That is the hope of what's possible when we reach that level of maturity that throughout antiquity has been expressed and written about and professed. So what does that look like? What does integral leadership look like? Well, it looks like taking care of ourselves through understanding how the postmodern worldview, the modern worldview, and the traditional worldview live within me. There is my mom and dad that live within me. They have a seat at my dinner table, and every thought that I have is going to bounce up against that. That's the super ego. There's my ego, right, that, that thinks I know everything, and it's going to take the wheel all the time, right? And there's the postmodern part of me. There's my, my Naropa University college experience of just wanting the freedom of suffering from all others, else I'd be nauseous and uncomfortable. And so I have to teach those people to sit at the dinner table and be good family members and listen to each other and reconcile each other and not throw the other under the bus or sweep under the carpet when it doesn't suit me, right? That is integral consciousness. It is truly going where we have to go to be uncomfortable places to reconcile our karmas that live within us. So when we, we encounter them externally through our most important relationships, our business partners, our, and our spouses, and our family members, and the stranger that we encounter on the street, we can meet them with the dignity that they deserve. Beautiful. What a, what a beautiful exposition. So that that definition of leadership you know of reconciling reconciling all these different elements of ourselves at our internal dinner table mm -hmm. how does doing that internally help me become a better leader in my external mm -hmm. organizations mm -hmm. yeah sure so if if i know so this is intrapersonal development right understanding like having a deeper relationship with ourselves the, the constituent parts of ourselves so having more holism a more whole authentic presence there. If I can find that those postmodern parts within me that are rankled by racial in inequity or damage to the environment or any of these other concerns, and I give the time and space to allow those to have a mo more mature understanding, meaning I recognize the dignities and the disasters. I'm not being absolutist. I'm not just reactively taking one perspective. Actually, I am all the time. I'm just recognizing when and how I do that. When I encounter someone outside of me, like let's say I'm a manager of a company and one of my employees comes and starts saying, hey, you're a white male. You are the patriarchy. I don't trust you. And actually, I'm going to undermine your authority. My natural reaction 
is going to take one shape. It's going to look one way. It's going to say like, well, sorry, I'm in power. So I can actually fire you. I can watch that temptation pass like the cloud that it is. I can watch the next one and I can keep listening. And ideally I can ask a question <laughs> and not take the temptation of asking the manipulative leading question that is going to have them trust me less, but an authentic question. What am I not understanding about where they're coming from? Right? Those are the first beats. That's what I want to train myself and remind myself to do. I know with my clients, my, when I have a CEO who I really want to impress and make sure that I'm giving my best value, I will over-advise. I will talk too much and try to give advice to where, so when I see myself doing that and I feel it in my body, the trick is ask questions, always coming back to asking questions, leading Socratically. Yeah. And so, you know, one of the things I like with this podcast is, and it's not always possible, but it's to give like a little, a little tidbit or a little tool um, mm. that all the listeners can just immediately integrate and practice in their lives. So that, that seems like a good one. And I, I know that's something that I, I practice a lot and I love is that when in doubt, ask more questions mm -hmm. rather than thinking that like, oh, I already have the answers. And if I, if I talk more or spew more, it's going to solve the situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you, do you want to elaborate that, make that more precise? Do you think that's a good tidbit for people to walk away with? Is there a better one? Well, we can go one step deeper with it. And, and it's a bit of a risk because like all tools like this, they can be used for evil as well as for good. But the point is to recognize when I'm using it for one or the other. So if this tool is to be used for good, um, one step deeper than asking a follow-up question from genuine curiosity is to first recognize the experience that I'm having. So I, I hinted at that by seeing, watching, you know, my impulses, but can I reveal my impulses? Can I notice and label to myself and even externally? And so one of the, the core power psychotechnologies that I use in, in, in my workshops and, and from the community that I come from, we call the noticing game. And so the noticing game, are you familiar? Yes. Yes. But we can, oh, I, we could play. I mean, I, I'd love to demonstrate it or, you know. I... <laughs> so, so hearing that I, I'm noticing now, like, it's like a, like a, a joy that the community that I come from has extended so far that the person that I'm meeting for the first time is familiar with it and lights up with a smile when I name it. Hmm. Yeah. And hearing that I'm also feeling this, this kind of vibration in my heart, in my rib cage, that we're getting to a place where people can feel comfortable being vulnerable and it's met with a smile. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like hearing that, it's almost like a bittersweetness of like all of the challenges I've had to go through and like playing at this, at this level, but this, the, the true belief and faith, like I feel grounded in my body. Like I feel the weight of my body in my chair. Like there's a deep trust that yes, as the world keeps, you know, developing and, and being drawn to this space that we are taking care of what's most important. And hearing that, I, f I felt a sadness mm -hmm. and then a rush of, of gratitude for, I don't, I don't know what you've experienced, but I'm, I'm glad that you persevered. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think in, in kind of conclusion and hearing that it's like, I, I, I want to offer a, like an intention that for those of us, me, you, anyone who's in these communities that have kind of in some ways like taken this bodhisattvic vow to go wherever we need to go, to go into this realm of consciousness, that we, we really stay in relationship with ourselves and those in our lives all the way, that we, 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 we go where we need to go and we show up all the way, even when it gets hard, so that we really can have the good, true, and beautiful experience of being alive and in relationship with each other, all the way top to bottom. All 
right, everyone. Thank you so much for listening. That um, that was a mouthful, Encore, and uh, I'm I'm impressed. There was there was a lot in that interview that was probably a little over my head, and um, maybe maybe some of the audience feels the same way. So I I'd just like to pull it back. There was a moment towards the end that uh, it really locked in for me. Tell me and about it. Was, it. Well, it was you saying the um the service or the the benefit that this integral perspective has had for you uh in your life and i just wonder if you could maybe we could talk about that we could use that as a starting point and i know i know we got a lot of the sort of definitions and the uh, vocabulary of the integral perspective throughout what we just listened to would you be willing to just kind of boil it down one more time one final time for the listener yeah, um, I'll do. I'll do my best. Might be might be different than what came out in the interview. Sure. But one one of the things I like, I really like the color coding uh -huh. because it helps me get away from the minutia of the jargon that describes kind of intellectually these different movements. And mm -hmm. it's, it's this kind of shorthand. And I I see my own life and my own development as and, and all of us as encapsulating all of these different perspectives and developmental stages. And I know there's times, most days, where I just want to react out of a pure drive for self-interest and power. And maybe I'm being threatened and there's like anger. And there's, you know, it's what the, the integral people would call the red level. Mm -hmm. Maybe they call it purple, I forget what it is. But then there, there's other times where I'm really like acting in terms of allegiance to certain beliefs. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's, I think they call that blue. And mm -hmm. then there's times where I'm just being like super mechanical and rational and computational, which mm -hmm. they'll call orange. And then mm -hmm. there's times where I'm really like seeing, trying to see the whole system or the whole person of who I'm relating to, mm -hmm. which they call green. And each of these ways of being in my mind has advantages and disadvantages. And each of them are like tools in a toolbox that ideally, as we like seek to grow and be better humans in our relationships, we're using the right tool at the right time. Mm -hmm. And I like having the tools. I'd like to have more, you know, creating more tools, knowing what they are, and being able to see when I or when someone else uses one of these tools, the advantage of that tool, even if it's not being used advantageously in that moment. Mm -hmm. And so then I can get away from just a criticism or a judgment of, oh, well, that person doesn't get it, or that person's, you know, thinking hierarchically, or that person is, is just um, identified with their in-group and is, you know, impatient or prejudiced against people in the out-group. And I can see kind of more where they're coming from, engage more in a sense of like curiosity. And that, I mean, that's a really practical thing. So, you know, one of my heroes, Vinoba Bhave, I don't know if we've talked about this guy before. I'm not familiar. He's a, you know, I don't, I could go off on Vinoba Bhave for hours, but he's a Gandhian like social justice worker. So okay. he was, he was, he was a young man when he came to Gandhi, he was formed a lot by Gandhi, but he also is this really brilliant philosopher in his own right, much more educated than Gandhi ever was. He spoke 11 languages. He read all the religious traditions of the world, all their texts in their original. He was a, he was a sage in a kind of way. But this guy, Vinoba Bhave, really big in a nonviolent civil disobedience, like Gandhi in the Gandhian tradition. And he would, he would always say, you go to someone that you're resisting or someone you want something, like a, like a rich landowner that you want to you know, decentralize their holdings and give it to the landless peasants in their town, which was one of his causes that he walked all over India for over 20 years trying to do that. Um, and he would say, if you're looking at that guy as a wall and, you, and all you can see are his negative characteristics, you're never going to get through to him. You're never going to get the practical outcome you want. But if you look for the door or the window, you look for the, the goodness that you can already find through his behavior and you can connect with, that's the way to get your personal aims. You know, is to, is to appeal to them through that door, to open that door rather than banging your head against the wall. And I feel like that's what this integral perspective gives me, you know, when you strip away all the vocab and everything. It just mm -hmm. gives me the the motivation or the confidence or the impetus to, to know that we all have that door mm -hmm. and I can, I can find a way to connect with anyone. 
I have no idea if that was remotely similar to what I talked about in the interview. I, <laughs> Is that satisfying? <laughs> it was satisfying. It was remotely similar. And maybe it gives a little bit of context. I'll just follow up with another question. What do you suspect that this integral perspective or is it fair to call it a methodology um i i don't know i'm not i'm not i'm not like so deep in the camp that i would have i see I, well, i'm let, happy let with you calling it that maybe i'll just say the camp <laughs> maybe i'll just say the camp then yeah to use. so what, what do you what do you think or suspect the integral camps what, what project do they presuppose like to what end is this tool serving? Is it to serve kind of a higher synthesis? Oh, yeah. I mean, integral, do we mean the integration of these different levels of development? Oh, totally. Yeah. And so from my my perspective, as like, clearly, I should have asked our guests this, right? But I, I didn't get to or we didn't have the time. But I, I see them in this like Hegelian kind of tradition of synthesis yeah. of opposites. Yeah. And the, it does serve the dialectic in a way in, an, yeah. in, in a fresh way, maybe that other critical theories don't have the tools or the language to. Yeah, and the, and the goal is is to like the the flowering of I think human potential or maybe mm -hmm. like all species potential, but just like the the kind of evolution of consciousness, you know, like the 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 small plant of consciousness growing, sprouting these leaves, you know, sprouting this flower, the the bud of the flower unfolding and being fully open and this like incredible perfume of truth and love and beauty filling the room. Hmm. That's so poetic. That's how I would describe it. I, <laughs> so but, but this is a moment, something I so wanted romantic. to say. <laughs> you make human evolution just sound so sexy. Well, your, that's, man. that's like, um, it's, it's, it's the luxury that I can do that. And this is, this is my like little homage to Ken Wilber. When I, I when I read Ken Wilber's book, Sex, Ecology and Spirituality, which is incredibly long, incredibly dense and just full of all these like almost like meaninglessly complex phrases you know it just took me so long to understand it and read it mm -hmm. by the end when i got it what he was trying to say which is this the thing the mystics have always been trying to tell us about like you know the oneness and the complexity and you know he introduced me to orobindo and many other philosophers that have since like i've had a real um i've been really transformed by i had this moment of just incredible gratitude for the sacrifice that ken wilber went through in like reading all these books and writing all these like very complicated sentences and pages and chapters and books where he could have done exactly the same thing with a haiku and there's like mystic poets throughout the world like you know, people like rumi or you know whoever that get to the same realizations with just a few lines of a haiku or like a piece of music and ken wilber's path was to do it through these like incredibly difficult books so a certain part of the population would have access to it and i just really respect that he went and did that and i'm really grateful that he put it in this very kind of boxy rational way so that other people have access to it i feel like he didn't have to do that he just like took that on as a project mm -hmm. at, at, at great sacrifice i think uh-huh so thanks ken thank you ken wilbur yeah and uh, the conversation wraps up with you guys doing this little noticing exercise, which I, I couldn't help but acknowledge or recognize that uh, a mutual client of ours, uh, Benjamin, yeah, brought to a group that we facilitate yeah. not so long ago. Yeah. Did you record this interview prior to us having that live event? No, it was after that. And Benjamin was actually the person that recommended that Robert be on the podcast. Oh, I see. Oh, well, that but I had I had done that exercise before years mm -hmm. ago, uh, uh -huh. and so it was awesome when Benjamin brought it to our group, and then it just made sense to go. Well, it's lovely that this is you know in in the tradition of Encore trying to extract one useful tool that could potentially transform a listener's life if they were to apply it in earnest. We ended up in this little noticing exchange between you and Robert. And if I could say it in my own words, what that little nugget is, it was 
asking questions. I, I, you reflected back to him that it was asking questions, but I think there was another part in what he was saying just before that that maybe is worth amplifying, which was that he was checking in with how he felt in his body and being present to that and then asking a question. So the noticing game then became kind of the perfect expression of both those things. It's to stop and, and wait, maybe back up a little bit because he was juxtaposing that to the tendency that when he's with a client to just start forcing meaning into the meaning pool, mm -hmm. just start preaching and spewing out advice. Um, a tendency I'm familiar with. <laughs> In fact, I remember we recorded one of these a couple of weeks ago and we, we did the first take and I just launched into all my ideas and I just saw the look in your face just slightly go from disinterested to kind of appalled. And then I just stopped. <laughs> I stopped. I said, okay, let's just, I don't need to hear it. Let's, I don't need to hear you say cut. Let's just take it again. And immediately I started again with a question. Yeah. And it, it changed our exchange. So to me, that was probably one of the most meaningful takeaways from, from this conversation. And with all the theory that you guys went through, and some of it was pretty dense, um, both your reflection on why the integral theory or camp uh, we could say, is meaningful to you and supportive of this flowering of human potential or evolution combined with this little process or nugget that someone could take with them of checking in with what they're feeling or noticing and then posing it back to their their colleague or their partner as a question. Seems so profound. 100%. Thank you. Thank you. I loved every component of that restating the game, your own reflection, and then the vulnerability of your own personal experience with it. I think that's a perfect teaching tool. <laughs> so thanks for going there, Nate. Cool. Well, I hope everyone enjoyed as much as I did. And uh, make sure to reach out to us. We do have a Twitter account. We rarely post to it. But uh, hopefully that'll change in the coming weeks as I take the helm. That's right. Oh, and, and just I'd like to express once again, gratitude. Someone, someone reminded me, they, someone actually did reach out because they had heard that first the first episode where I announced our Twitter yeah. and they were they were just they thought it was hilarious like the trepidation in my voice <laughs> about the Twitter. So I'm I'm just so happy that you are now in control of that. Yes, well, okay. For now, and maybe we revisit this in six more episodes if we still don't have our first tweet yet. In our meeting a week ago, you said, uh, you know, let's do something like this at the end of the episode where we ask people to engage with us on social media and I you know, I think we both agree that it's uh, necessary for us to engage first. Yeah. By posting something. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> All right, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Talk to you next time. That concludes another episode of 10,000 Heroes. Your hosts were Ankur Shah Delight and Nathan Ramos. Special thanks to Pierre for the awesome episode artwork and to DJ Plainview for our theme music. If you like the show and you want to support our mission and our growth, here are three things you can do. One, think of three people you know who would enjoy the episode you just listened to and tell them about it. Call them on the phone, send them a text, send them a link, whatever, but share your enthusiasm. Two, leave a glowing review on your podcast platform if they support it. Having lots and lots of glowing reviews is a great way for us to get found by other listeners. And three, get in touch. Email us at info at 10kh.show. Follow us on Twitter at 10khshow. Connect us with people you know who would be great guests. Give us constructive feedback. Or just like in point one above, share your enthusiasm. Thank you and take care.